Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the third part of his Prolegomena to Any Future Metaphysics, Immanuel Kant is going to set out and discuss three transcendental ideas that get us in trouble. They lead reason astray if we're not careful, and that's why we need a critique of pure reason, a critical examination by reason of itself, as well as of the understanding and sensibility. And the third of these is what Kant terms the theological idea. And as opposed to the earlier psychological ideas and cosmological ideas, which were plural, at least certainly in the case of the cosmological, it's a little bit debatable with the psychological, this is singular. It could only be singular, and it's quite different from the other ideas. And the discussion of it is quite short. As a matter of fact, Kant is going to finish by saying, as the observations of the critique on the pretensions of our of transcendental theology are intelligible, clear, and decisive, I have nothing more to add on the subject, which means that you know, as opposed to all the other discussions where we've been able to just stick to the prolegomena, we probably do need to look at the critique rather briefly, at least the section on the ideal of pure reason for a few other important nuggets or kernels of information. But let's look first at the distinction that he is going to draw. So he tells us that the third transcendental idea, which affords material for the most important use of reason, uh, but then he qualifies this, but if pursued only speculatively, transcendent and therefore dialectical use of reason, right? So there's another thing that we should point out here that goes outside of the scope of the prolegomena. So, you know, talking about a purely speculative as opposed to practical use of reason means that we can make a distinction here between when this is going to be, let's say, illegitimate and when this will actually have some legitimacy to it. Within the practical sphere, as we find out in later works, as for example, the second critique, the critique of practical reason, also in uh, arguably uh, religion within the bounds of reason alone, what we have is uh, a different use of this ideal, idea, ideal, right? So he goes on and he says that this is the ideal of pure reason, not just an idea, but something that goes beyond it. And if we want to understand what that means, we'll have to go to the critique as we'll do shortly. First, he's going to say, this one works differently than the psychological and the cosmological ideas that we've already looked at earlier in this part of the work. How so? He tells us that in the psychological and cosmological ideas, reason starts from experience, right? Erfahrung, uh, experience of things in the world, experience of our own capacity to know, to cognize, to judge, to do all these sorts of things. And it errs, it goes wrong by exaggerating here, Steigerung, sort of you know, heaping up, raising up their grounds, the grounds of experience. Why? Because it strives to attain 
if possible, the absolute completeness, vollständigkeit, something we've talked about quite a lot, the perfection, the being brought to complete fruition, going beyond experience of their series. So it could be a cosmological, could be a psychological uh, series in this case, but what the ideas are doing, you know, for example, in you know, conceiving of a soul as some sort of eternally lasting thing that is the locus of our consciousness, right? It's going beyond experience. You can't experience a soul in that respect. Or think about the cosmological ideas. We looked at the different antinomies. You know, some of these pertain to the nature of the universe. Some of them pertain to causality. They also have to do with moral ideas like freedom, right? So they're att attempting to attain completeness of the series, which we find in experience. We don't actually find it in experience, of course, but it helps to make sense of our experience, or at least so we think, right? I mean, these are problematic. These are part of a dialectic. What does the theological ideal do? So he says that it breaks with experience. It's not about experience at this point. And from mere concepts, mere concepts, begriffe, of something else, what constitutes absolute completeness, vollständigkeit, of a thing. No longer a series, but a thing, ein Ding, right? A single thing in general. Hence, by means of the idea of a most perfect, and again, we have, you know, uh, vollständig, right? Perfected, uh, a, a most perfect primal being. Now, primal being, urwesen. Right? Wesen can mean being, the ur tracing it back further, right? So a originary, a beginning being, right? We uh, think of this idea by means of which, uh, using this as a mittel, right? Um, a, a, a way in which we can approach this. So mere concepts of what constitutes the absolute completeness of a thing in general, thinking about the most perfect Thing, no longer things in general. It goes on to determine the possibility, the möglichkeit, whether something can be, and the actuality, the wirklichkeit, of all other beings. Now, you know, if you know your you know, metaphysics, the history of it, and theology, you recognize that what Kant is talking about here is traditionally what we refer to as God, but it could be anything else. It could be Spinoza's substance. It could be all sorts of other things, so long as it's taken to be the absolute, the primal, the final, the best, whatever it is, being. So he goes on and he says that um, the mere presupposition of a being, which although not in the series of experiences, is thought for the purpose of experience, to make sense out of our experience, and for the sake of conceiving its conception, or its connection, rather, uh, its order and its unity, its Beziehung, Ordnung, and Einheit, right? When we are trying to make sense out of our experience, the vast experience that we have, Kant says that we inevitably are going to gravitate towards thinking about something that, you know, lies behind the experience, the appearances of experience, the representations, and is some sort of primal unity that gives connection, order, and unity to our experiences, right? Does this exist? We can't say that it does exist. That's where the transcendental illusion comes in with this one, a dialectical illusion. And Kant tells us two things about this. 
What is the, the illusion? Making uh, subjective conditions of our thinking into the objective conditions of objects. Mistaking what it is that our thinking leads us to as, it, as if it were the reality of things. So just because we wind up thinking about some, you know, total unity, some absolute being, ah, it must exist. No, Kant is saying it doesn't exist. And it's something that we just come up with and, it, we, you know, we project into uh, reality. He also talks about making a hypothesis necessary for the satisfaction of our reason. So this is a hypothesis, this uh, ideal of pure reason, uh, a hypothesis necessary for our reason, our faculty of reason to be satisfied. Uh, we make it into a dogma, a belief, something that we buy into. And he tells us that this is a mistake, right? We can easily expose this dialectical illusion. And then he tells us the observations of the critique are intelligible, clear, and decisive. I have nothing more to add on the subject. Well, we should add a little bit more <laughs> on the subject taken from the critique. And there's a few things. I'm not going to go through the entire section, the ideal of pure, pure reason, but there are a few things that we should signal. So the first thing, this terminology, idea, ideal, right? He says that, um, Ideas are more remote from object, objective reality than categories. No appearance can be found in which they may be represented. In concreto, they contain a certain completeness that no possible empirical cognition ever achieves. Okay, so we, we've already got that before in the prolegomena, but he says something that seems to be even further removed from objective reality than the idea is what I call the ideal by which I understand the idea, not merely in concreto, but in individuo, that is as an individual thing, which is determinable or even determined through the idea alone. And, you know, he gives some examples of this, talks about Plato a bit. Let's move on a little bit further. Um, he is going to talk about um, the material of all possibility, which is supposed to contain a priori the data for the particular possibility of everything, the idea of the sum total of all possibility, right? And he's going on a little bit further. He's going to say this must be called an ideal of pure reason, right? And a little bit further, he's going to bring this, we could say, into... Uh, a context of traditional ways of thinking about these things. The object of reason's ideal, which is to be found only in reason, is called the original being, ens originarium. Okay, so that is pretty similar to the urvesen that we were talking about here in the prolegomena. Um, because it has nothing above itself, it's also called the highest being, ens summum. And because everything else as condition stands under it, it is called the being of beings, ens entium. And then he goes on and he says, this does not signify the objective relation of an actual object to other things, but only that of an idea to concepts. As to the existence of a being of such preeminent excellence, it leaves us in complete ignorance. We don't know whether something like this exists. We can't say that with certainty. We can say reason wants us to buy into this, but this is why reason has to be very careful and critical and engage in, indeed, critique of itself and stay away from falling into the dialectical illusion of these transcendental ideas particularly this one, the theological idea or the ideal of pure reason. 